the question that I'm trying to answer today at the beginning of this conference is where is tertiary prevention today? And what I want to do with my 15 minutes is to look back, look forward, and outline what I believe are key challenges. Um, the first piece of my address is to share the good news. Tertiary prevention is bigger today. It's better. It's become more mainstream. It's widely accepted in the sense that most policymakers understand why it is necessary, that it's not a substitute for police or for security agencies, and that needs to be funded, developed, and maintained. Now, I particularly think about the situation 10 years ago, which I'm old enough to remember. Um, 10 years ago, people were, first of all, convinced that jihadist terrorism was over that Al-Qaeda had been defeated, that the threat was steadily declining, and that we could probably move on to pay attention to other things. Uh, there were prevention providers in countries like Germany, for example, but there were few, uh, often based on charismatic individuals like Claudia Danschke or Thomas Mücke, doing their thing without necessarily having the structures or the funding to do it. The only exception, perhaps, was Britain and the Netherlands. Then, however, two years later, which is about eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, came ISIS. And with ISIS came a situation in which security agencies were suddenly completely overwhelmed. Um, they had to deal with a number of cases that they couldn't deal with possibly. And as well as the number of cases, as well as a quantitative problem, there was also realization that people weren't necessarily planning terrorist attacks. They were planning to go to Syria, which made it much more difficult to prosecute them because in many countries, that wasn't even a criminal offense back then. And it became clear that security agencies, law enforcement in particular, weren't just able to cope with the numbers. They were also not having the right instruments. So. Better late than never, but in many European countries from 2015 onwards, tertiary prevention was taken seriously, funding came forward, structures were established, and we gradually got to the point where we are today. Now, if we wanted to, we could sit down, relax, and believe that everything is great, but we're not doing that, of course, because we realize that things are moving on, even though the situation is probably for prevention providers, it's much more comfortable than it was 10 years ago. Things haven't stood still, and we want tertiary prevention to still exist and thrive and be good in 10 years' time. We need to understand what is changing. So how is radicalization in Europe different from 10 years ago? Um, I would mention five trends and developments that we need to pay attention to, some of which, of course, are well known to you and we'll talk about for the rest of the day. But here are my five trends that I believe will continue to shape the environment that we're in. The first one is the diversification of extremists. 10 years ago, we were dealing with stereotypical angry young men. Today, we still have angry young men, but some of them are very young and some of them are bordering on middle age. We have children, we have females, and I'm glad to see that Gina Vale is in the audience, who is probably the leading expert in Europe today on, on women and terrorism. All of these groups pose different challenges. The logic of tertiary prevention to identify needs and to address them, the logic of tertiary prevention remains the same, but the consequences and the content surely need to be adapted. I'm glad to say plenty of prevention providers across the continent are already doing so. So that's one. The second trend is, of course, the role of the internet. That's not a new trend. In fact, I remember 10 years ago, I was writing a report about that topic. But of course, the internet itself is evolving. And so it will remain a significant development for many years to come. Nearly all attacks in the past few years were carried out by lone attackers. And while many of them have emerged from existing jihadist milieus, they not only attacked by themselves, it's clear that significant part of their radicalization had taken place online. 
So don't get me wrong. I think we still need street workers. We still need people who know their neighborhoods, who understand what's happening around the corner. But we also, and in addition to that, need to work on the virtual corners in which people hang out as much as they do on the streets. How do you reach them there? We're talking a lot these days about digital prevent work, but I haven't seen many good practices of online work that would have matched what's going on offline. That's an area that we still need to work on. Third trend, and partly as a consequence of that, extremist groups have attracted significantly more people with mental health issues. 10 years ago, the assumption, I remember that very well from reading the literature, 10, even 20 years ago, the assumption used to be that terrorists were unremarkable when it came to mental health, that groups, terrorist groups would filter, would filter out the crazy ones, so to speak. So if anything, um, the argument was that people becoming involved in violent extremism were, if anything, less likely to have a history of mental health problems than the rest of the population. Now, that's clearly no longer true. Both amongst Islamists and amongst the far right, extremists are attracting a growing amount, growing percentage of people with, in some cases, very severe issues, including up to psychoses. And while Whilst 10 years ago, very few psychologists, psychiatrists were working in tertiary prevention, now nearly every new ad, job ad I see on the internet is for people with an experience in these areas. And that's a trend I believe will continue. And the nexus between radicalization and mental health is becoming ever thicker. So that's the third trend. The fourth trend is a shift to prisons. 2010, at my center, we did a study on prison radicalization. And one of the case studies was the Netherlands. And it was striking me at that point that the whole country at that point had a, a terrorist prisoner population, a total terrorist prisoner population of three, three individuals that obviously authorities were thinking about, but it was a very manageable number. Today, it is nearly 20 times that number, including not only men, but women and people from different ideologies. And this kind of picture is being replicated everywhere. As a consequence, mainly of ISIS in the first instance, many people have ended up in prison, often on short sentences, and are due for release very soon. France, for example, more than half of the jihadist prisoner population will be released in the next 18 months. What does that mean for prevention work, for the work inside of prison, for the link with probation once people are being released? Lots of countries are struggling with that. Questions are being asked in Germany, in Austria, in Britain, where people who've been serving time in prison have committed terrorist offenses after being released. It's an urgent issue. It's an issue that policymakers are intensely interested in, and I'm sure that a significant part of the action, so to speak, will be in this area. So what's the fifth trend, the final trend that I want to briefly touch upon today? Finally, of course, we're seeing the growth of different ideologies. There is an ideological diversification as well as a diversification of demographics. Ten years ago, nearly all of it, nearly all of the work that people like us and people in prevention were doing was about jihadist terrorism and jihadist radicalization. And of course, everyone knows we have since about 2015-16 seen a rapid growth in uh, far-right extremism, especially lone actors, transnationally networked, that are highly active on the internet. In many countries, including in Britain, where we have the best data, more than half of the people receiving treatment as part of the channel program in Britain are far-right extremists now. But while we're adapting to that, the next big thing is already on the horizon. I think, I'm convinced, as a result of the pandemic, uh, we've seen the rise of yet another new movement, which revolves this time around conspiracy theories, is opposed to lockdowns and vaccines, 
believes that our democracies are in reality totally terran dictatorships. It's in many respects a weird movement, and it's certainly not a consolidated movement. And I think it's too simple to describe it as far right, because I believe it is much more complex. More research is needed, but also more action is needed on behalf of prevention providers, because over the past six months, this movement has clearly radicalized. We are seeing the development of narratives of resistance that justify violence. And we've seen, in fact, the first acts of violence carried out by supporters of that movement. How are we going to respond to that? How, what is this new movement? And what is tertiary prevention going to do about it? So this is the challenge, a diversification of radicalization in terms of demographics, more and more of the action online, a growing nexus between radicalization and mental health, a challenge of prisons and of new movements and ideologies, especially post-pandemic. It's not going to be boring. You can rest assured of that. Tertiary prevention has had big successes in Europe, but it can't stand still. It needs to change, it needs to adapt, and most importantly, I believe, it needs to explain itself a lot better to policymakers and to the public. And with that, I want to close. One criticism and one regret is that prevention providers have not been doing enough to explain their work. They've been so focused on doing their stuff that they haven't focused enough on explaining their work to the public, of explaining their successes to an often still skeptical public and policymakers. And I want prevention providers to understand that this is an important part of their job. It is, in fact, an existentially important part of their job. If you want to sustain this work, you need to educate the public that, just like any other social activity, or just like any government activity, there's no 100% success rate. Mistakes and failures will happen. But that equally, the successes are more frequent than the failures and mistakes. And that you have, in fact, stopped people from killing and dying as much as the police has. I don't think people understand that. And that includes even people who generally approve of the work that you're doing. So as we move forward, my message is continue to do your work, adapt to new challenges, and most importantly, speak more about your work and make sure everyone understands why it's important. That's why this event is important because it allows us to speak to people. And again, I'd like to thank Sophia, uh, Christian, and Alexander for providing me and everyone else with this opportunity. Thank you.